Oh, you've been on the show several times in the past, and yeah. we're usually at an event when we talk to you, so we usually hit the ground running. You know, we talk about Bitcoin, we talk about film, music, advertising, fashion. Uh, so we've explored this general topic of creativity together in a, in a variety of ways. But one thing that we've never really talked about that I've always been very interested in, maybe we touched on it a little bit, was your background. Uh -huh. And we're, we're talking about the online world right now through Fee. And I've heard you use the year 1995 for when the internet really began to flourish. So I'm interested, oh, wow. here's, here's a background question for Jeffrey Tucker. What did you do before the internet? What were you I, doing with your life? I, I wondered the other day, I saw a picture, uh, it was an executive sitting, it was the 1950s and he was sitting at a desk and I stared at the picture for a long time because I wondered what he did. Uh, he seemed to have a, a, a typewriter and there was a secretary in front of him taking notes. But I, I, you know, I thought about that world you know where where everything is just tied to the physical to physical property, mm. and you know you can think of something, but you have to type it out and give it to your secretary. She can put it in triplicates, and so now she's got three copies, but she still has to mail it to somebody. How did anybody function like that? I, I don't even know. It's just it's just bizarre. But you had to um, function in that world for well, for some time. I, I did, and I remember. Uh, the frustrations, you know, being at at the office and getting a phone call and somebody wanting a some content that they'd heard about vaguely on the street or something like that, and then you'd have to stick it in an envelope and get their physical address and mail it to them, and uh, you know that was just you know, that was just the way we thought the world worked. Well, I remember when I was, uh, you know, uh, an undergrad, doing research, you know, just like how difficult it was. They, they had these gigantic even to find out about. Uh, you know, institutions or publications, you had to go to like the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, you know, and look up things by topic and hope that they were classified right. And had tiny little printing. Then you'd find the address of a place and you'd, you'd send an envelope, you know, with a stamp. I mean, it's just unbelievable that we got by at all. And then it gradually began to change and in completely unexpected ways, uh, in ways that nobody really anticipated, which is one of the reasons I'm very happy to live in a world of radical uncertainty. I think that the less certain we are about the future, the more uh, uh, bright our hopes are for the future because, you know, openness is an opportunity for creativity. But it, you know, it began with sort of, um, uh, the internet opened its doors and that was awesome, but there was no web browser. So you couldn't, there wasn't anything to look at, but you could share information on a geographically non-contiguous basis for the very first time. So, you know, there's a modem, you could call up and send files back and forth. And that was kind of awesome. Then we had fax machines for things that had to be formatted in some way. And the fax machines were hilarious back in the old days. They were like refrigerators turned on their sides. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's how big they were. Um, and then I remember there was this thing called email that came along. And I'd gotten used to sort of calling people on modems and, and sharing information. Uh, and a friend of mine called up, called up his Tom Bethel, and he said, he said, Jeffrey, have you ever heard of email? I said, mm, vaguely, what do, what do you know about it? He said, well, you, you, you can take your message, and you send it out to like a, a box with a name, and it's like a person's uh, sort of box, and you send the message to them, and, and they can, at some point in the future, go and pick up what's in that box, and then send you something back, and at some point in the future, you can open your same box. And I said, well, where does it go in the meantime? You know, because, I mean, I'm still thinking in a physical way. Like, even modems, you had a sense of, like, porting something from here to there. Mm -hmm. So if the person didn't pick it up, I wanted to know where it went. And he said, I don't know. It just it just resides out there somewhere. <laughs> and I said, well, that's that's weird. And And I said, well, how does the person know? Uh, that he or she has gotten, you know, has a message waiting. And he said, well, I suppose you could just give him a phone call. <laughs> and, I said, and I thought, well, okay, so this is just an extra step. <clears throat> because if I was going to give a phone call, then I would just send, you know, call him up with, with a modem and transfer the information. And, and I said, I, you know, based on what you're telling me, I just can't see a future for this thing at all, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And so that, that was the end of it. I mean, and I didn't think about it again for another six months to a year. What yeah. year was that, roughly? Yeah, I think this might might have been maybe 1989. That's, yeah. So you were 
a young man in your 20s, yeah. a young professional, it's mm -hmm. hard for me to envision you being that myopic about technology. I just didn't, I couldn't see it. And, and it struck me as it's just kind of a silly uh, gimmick, you know, that it really had no, no future. And certainly we couldn't get beyond, you know, the, the modernity we've already experienced. And to tell you the truth, Brad, I was, I, you know, it sounds crazy now. And this is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about technology and creativity, innovation, and uncertainty now. But when the internet uh, was kind of, you know, sort of kicking into gear, and I'm talking about 93, 94, before the invention of the web browser, um, uh, I was a bit of a skeptic. You know, I mean, I think I sort of dabbled in, in a sort of atavism, you know, and uh, uh, and I, I was a techno, uh, you know, kind of debunker. I was like, oh, well, this new thing is not right. I, it's hard. It's hard for me to even to put myself in the mindset that I am myself inhabited in those days. Sure, I mean, yeah. Like, I don't recall how it is that I thought this or why, but I know for sure that I did. But I can't sort of recreate those same uh, that same mindset. So when the web browser came along in 1995, I was again a skeptic and of the web browser. It took me forever to upgrade from, you know, WordStar 5.0, you know, to to using a, a you know web-based um, word processing system, which in those days, you know, was uh, WordStar depreciated and, and WordPerfect was the thing. That was really before Word really began to take over, and. Um, yeah, I was I was adhering to the old thing. It took me a long time even to get a mouse, and and uh, you know I guess it was like ninety eight or ninety nine or something like that when I began to think, well, maybe I've underestimated this thing. And then then the uh, dot com bust came, and I remember feeling a little sense of vindication, like, uh, well, this thing wasn't so good after all. You know, it was, wow. it was all pets dot com. You know. And 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 really feeling like and a lot of people did you know the whole world just said, well, we've been we've been snookered into thinking this internet was going to be amount to something and I really didn't so I think it was about the year two thousand when I began to realize um, that I had I had really missed the mark in a big way and I remember the distinct moment when it happened <clears throat> I had in the meantime began to upload articles to. Uh, uh, the company's website at the time, and and just a little bit at a time. But it never occurred to me, okay, if I upload something to the internet, then you know, then those days six billion people could potentially see it. But so long as it remains like in my hands as a physical property, only one person can see it. Now that's a big difference, right? Mm, sure. And and I thought, you know, well, that's interesting. But why would they want to go to their computers to read something as versus just pick it up off the shelf? I mean, I know this, as I'm telling you this, I'm already feeling like listeners are thinking this is extremely stupid. But, you know, <laughs> but we know things now we didn't know then, right? So, um, so at some point I uploaded a couple of articles and I was sitting at my computer and I needed that article. And it was like sitting across the room in the bookshelf and I could see it, but I was sitting down in my chair. And I thought, wow, I could just click a button on this machine and access the article, or I could get out of my chair and go pick it up. I thought, what if lots of people feel that same way? You know, what if it's just a, a time-saving measure, you know, to be able to click it on your computer instead of going over there? And uh, that was my first insight <laughs> to the possibility that the Internet could amount to something. And once I, that dawned on me, then I started uploading things. And then that new insight came to me that, oh, this is available to everybody. You don't have to have the physical property there. This is available to everybody. And I upload something one time, and it makes it infinitely available to a potential unlimited number of people. You know? And then, then the light went on. And I realized suddenly this is the most important tool that humankind has ever created. And yeah. I couldn't. And at that point, I realized I had been wrong. And I, I flipped around the other direction and, be, and became a, like a techno uh, enthusiast of the most extreme sort. And I devoted the next um, really 10, 
uh, 11 years to doing nothing but, but putting things online, from which I still benefit and from which humanity still benefits. So, and, 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 and instead of doing, I had to teach myself, um, web technology and that's when I became you know good at code and good at web building and, and now it's my profession. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, you and I were about 15 years apart, but I was having the exact same epiphany at the exact mm. same time. I had just graduated from college. I'd always eschewed things like, so, you know, 2000, 2001, and I lived in Western Vermont and I would commute at times to where I live on the New Hampshire seacoast. Um, the terrain between there uh, one place and the other, you know, we're talking about the Revenant before we started recording today. It was like Revenant like territory. Like if your car broke down, you were in trouble. And I would do this drive all the time through the mountains. And I said, why would I ever need a cell phone? Who would I call? Uh, so you, it's like that trying to put myself, you, you mentioned earlier, trying to put yourself today in that mindset being incredibly difficult. I don't know what I was thinking, but when I graduated from college, I, I temporarily stopped my work in education to get a job in my degree, which was communication. So I was working in online marketing uh, for a ski resort. And that was where I was like, wow, look at what is of it. Look at what I can do uh, that I never, I mean, I, you know, in school for communications, we were laying out a local newspaper with hot wax, <laughs> you know? So, so to see what was possible just like three or four years later, as far as communicating, uh, was really uh, eye-opening. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, and I think that changed people's technological priorities. You know, like that that being online all the time, not wanting to miss headlines. The the best thing we had at, at, uh, that I remember was uh, Yahoo. You could make a homepage that was yeah. like custom, you know, all the things you wanted to see when you opened the Internet, and I thought that was the most amazing thing. Uh, it was a, a great precursor to uh, to MySpace for sure, um, but I, I wanted to just jump back to. By the way, speaking of yeah. cell phones, I, I mean it's funny that you mentioned that because I was a, initially a cell phone skeptic too, which is yeah. ridiculous. Because I, I remember being as a child, my my parents would would take me out on these uh, fishing trips, and I and I didn't like them, you know, mm. uh, because uh, they were both they were both sort of teacher professors, so they had three months off in the summer. So we'd get in the station wagon. And drive to to California, to Colorado, to wherever, and you know, just sitting in the car those endless hours was very difficult. And I remember I used to take a, 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 a I'd entertain myself forever with this. I'd take a little paper clip, and I'd bend up one end of it so it became like an antenna, and I'd hold it up to my head, <laughs> and I would talk on it, you know, and I'd talk talk to whomever for endless hours on my on my tiny little uh, paper clip cell phone, you know, it was an imaginary friend or something. I'm not sure what I, but I loved it. So I should have, you know, I did this as a child. So I should have, you know, been one of the first people in the cell phone realm. But I even I, that I delayed a little bit. Um, I remember I don't think I've ever told the story before. It's actually one of those nightmare uh, sort of stories that that you try to suppress. But I remember I was going on a drive somewhere, and and an old man who was of some means said, "Hey, look, if you're going on a drive, it's going to take you two or three hours." It might be good for you to to take this uh, thing with you, which I never used. And there was a big box with a phone in it, and I said, "Well, how do you use it?" He said, "Well, you just you just call. It's just, you know, if you get into trouble or something like that, you just call. You know, you call a number, and and it goes through." And I was like amazed. I thought, "Well, great." So I was on the on the road, and I thought, "Well, maybe I'll try this thing." And I called up a friend, and I began to talk while I was driving. And it was so delightful that I talked for like a, upwards of an hour to them on the phone. And then, then the next month the bill came and it was, you know, like $1,500. <laughs> and so he was in shock, you know, uh, and an alarm and looking at me with his eyes popping out like I can't even believe this happened. And I was just mortified. I mean, I had no idea you'd have to actually pay for that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, it's so. the phone. Yeah, and and so then I so I got the I got the flip phone and that was great. And I remember my friend David Vexler came up to me at a party one time. He said, "Hey, look at my new iPhone." And I said, "What is that?" He said, "Well, it's pretty awesome. Here's what it does." And he held it up and he turned it this way and he turned it that way and the and the screen shifted from this way to that way. And I, again, I mean, you know, I've just had a lifetime of being wrong. I looked at it and I thought, "That's dumb." I mean, <laughs> who's going to use that? <laughs> I remember, that was, yeah, that was two thousand eight. 2008. Can you believe it? What? Why did you think it was dumb? I, I just, uh, I don't know. I just thought, well, if you're going to use a computer, why wouldn't you just use use your desktop? Why would you want to use a computer on your 
on your phone. It doesn't make any sense. You know, so I just didn't see the future. It really, I mean, I, I've, I've been wrong for so long that, you know, I've now come to a different sort of mindset about this whole thing. I, I'm really glad about uh, uncertainty in the world. I don't think I have all the answers. I, I, I'm always prepared for technology to change life. Uh, fundamentally, I, I'm very interested in the new things. I, I don't trust my first instincts. You know, I, I, I look out the window more. Uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, um, to see what's going on, mm. and I'm, I'm much more of a student of the progress of history than I used to be, and that's it's been a humbling, uh, humbling experience. But it's also, I think, made me uh, more creative. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I wanted to just uh, return to you as a younger man. What kind of work were you doing when you first encountered the online world, or you first became aware of the existence? Of uh, I was working. I was working at Mises as an as an as an editor for our physical publications. I mean, that that's sort of what I did, which meant um, you know typesetting things in you know phys in a physical way and yeah. faxing content back and forth and that sort of thing, printing things and and mailing them. Um, and when I think about just all the the time that I spent doing that, it's, it's just it's just mind boggling, and it's hard to understand. But you know, uh, again, we didn't know what was coming, so we didn't know how bad we had it. I remember being just wildly enthusiastic for every new typesetting kind of program that came out. My my first experience with computers in general was in college, and it was I was so grateful for it because my handwriting is so incredibly bad. That I got, I think one of the earliest like Commodore sixty fours, you know, and I think I, I uh, that was became a kind of a mass market item. When uh, am I saying that right? Yeah, I think it was a Commodore mm. sixty four. Yep, mass market item when I was about a junior, and I just went to town and I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. I remember my undergraduate thesis was about one hundred and sixty pages, which was um, you know beat the record for the for the university you know for for you know, from all time in terms of length and I love typing and writing so much that i I'm embarrassed to say it i mean it's actually i don't know if this is uh, right or wrong to say, but I would love, I loved writing other people's papers. And, and I would do this all the time. People would come to me and say, God, I have to write a paper in Russian history. And I would say, not a problem. I'll have it to you by midnight. You know, and I would just be like showing off, you know, so I wrote a ton of people's papers, other people's papers. I would do it for them, not for money, not for pay, not for anything, but just to, to show off and practice my chops. <laughs> 